This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Redemption. My name is Warren. I'm one of your pastors. Glad to be with you today on this Veterans Day weekend. And if you are a veteran, I just want to say thank you for your service and sacrifice. We're really grateful for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and today we are continuing on in our series through the book of Revelation, and we're hitting a milestone of sorts because we're getting to the seventh and final church that we'll be exploring in Revelation. And so I'm excited to jump into God's word, and so before we do that, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we we thank you for your word today. Uh, God, I thank you for this journey that we've taken through um, each church. Um, I pray, Lord, that as we've talked about each church, as we've explored each one, that we have examined ourselves through your words to the different churches. And so, God, we thank you for this opportunity to be directed um, in how we can be faithful. And I pray today would be another opportunity to do just that. Open up the eyes of our hearts, Lord, how us to see you and to receive your word today. Amen. Amen. I remember this one time, um, I was sitting in my barber, Johnny's chair. Right, and I'm sitting in the chair, and I'm like zoning out. I'm hearing his clippers. It's like music to my ears. And I'm sitting there, and then all of a sudden, I hear his clippers turn off. They turn off, and you know, I come to alertness, and I, I look at him. He's looking at me like this, right? And I don't know about you, but when your barber looks at you like that, it's a bit of a cause for concern, right? I'm like, I know there's a lot of real estate up here, but like... Are we good, right? Did you push my hairline back further? Like, please, don't, don't assist father time. He's got it, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, I was asking him, like, hey, what's going on? He's like, oh, no, nothing like that. I just noticed that there's this spot in your beard. And so I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't touch my beard. I never shave my beard. I'm going for the James Harden beard. Like, I don't touch my beard. I just let it grow. And he was like, look, look. And, and he shows me, he holds up a beard, and he shows me that there's this spot in my beard where the hair is completely gone. It's like smooth as a baby's bottom. They're just gone, right? And I'm like, oh, what is that? And Johnny, right, every time I go to him, I feel like it's an informal therapy appointment or something like that because he always has some just good words for me. He knows me really well. And he went, Warren, man, you got to stop stressing out so much. And he was right, right? The cause of that hair loss was stress. Right? I deal with stress, and when that happens, one of the effects that it has on my body right, is that my beard falls out. Now, here's what I know about stress. I know that when it comes to stress that I'm not the only person here who deals with it. No, in fact, stress is a heavyweight contender in many of our lives, right? so much so that a recent study showed that over 55% of Americans, when asked about the daily stress in their lives, they're like, yeah, I am completely stressed out. And I don't know about the rest of that percentage. I think they're just in denial, right? (laughs) Stress is a real factor in our lives, right? When it comes to the list of most stressed out countries, we usually rank near the top. You know, Americans, we love to be number one, right? And so when it comes to stress, we're, we're usually either at the top or really near to the top. And the interesting thing, right, is when you look at the different countries that are surrounding us on those lists, you go, okay, if I know even just a bit about their situations, like, I understand why why they would be stressed out. They're dealing with some heavyweight stuff. They're dealing with war, poverty, famine, and really difficult things. And when you consider our lives as Americans comparatively, you go, why are we so stressed out? We have access to all the luxuries. We have the appearance of doing so well, but yet underneath it all, there's this slow thing that's happening. There's this silent thing that's happening that's kind of eating away at us. For me, it's my beard, and stress does all sorts of different things to the body. And so as we dive into the church today of Laodicea, and we keep in mind this image, right, of the appearance of everything going well and something underneath the surface. I think something happened on the surface. I think that's a really good image for us to keep in mind. Because as we look at Jesus' words to this church, what we'll see is that he makes a similar assessment. He goes that they have the appearance of doing so well. They have the, the, all the trappings of wealth and resources and access, but he says underneath it all, there is something that is slowly eating away, slowly killing their ability to be faithful. So that's what we'll be, exp- that's what we'll be exploring today. What did Jesus have to say to this church with the appearance of hell, 
but yet underneath it, I had something at work that was crushing them. Open up your Bibles with me to Revelation 3, and we are going to be starting off in verses 14 through 17. It was just read. I'll read it again, and you can uh, either follow along in your Bible or follow along on the screen. It says this, to the angel of the church and lay the seer write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. If you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Today we see that Jesus, the great physician, says that self-sufficiency is silently killing the church in Laodicea. So here's what we want to do. We want to continue to do what we've done each week, and that is to kind of take a tour through these different cities, right? Take a tour through these cities and try to get just some understanding of their environment and the situations that they were facing. Because I feel like as we do that, we better understand Jesus' words and just their specific circumstances. And so what was the ancient city of Laodicea like in antiquity? Well, for one, it was a very prominent, wealthy, prosperous city. And it was that way because there was a lot of commerce and trade in the city, right? There were these huge factories that produced products that were exported all around the world. So it had like a textile factory where clothes were made, and then they, they were exported around the world. And then we even see Jesus allude to this in his words to the church. There was this factory where an eye medication was made, and so it was made there and then exported all around the world. And so this city was hustling and bustling. I was like New York City of sorts, right? Hustling and bustling, a city of great commerce and trade. But you see, that wasn't the only thing, right? That was some of the workings of the city, but there was something deeper even at the heart of the city. There was something deeper to its identity. You see, when it came to being a Laodicean citizen, it was an extremely, extremely prestigious thing, a prestigious title to hold. Why? Well, it had to do with an event in their history. In the year of AD 60, I think we've alluded to this in past sermons, there was this huge earthquake in the Asian region of Rome, right? And so you can imagine with the earthquake, that region itself is very prone to earthquakes even today, that an earthquake happened and all the different cities that, that were in that region were just devastated. Right? Their cities were totally devastated. It was total devastation. And what a lot of those cities had to do is they had to turn to the emperor of the time of Rome. His name was Nero. And they had to go, Nero, we really need your help. And Nero had to send resources for them to rebuild. And so that was the story for many of the other cities. But when it came to Laodicea, they were like, no, we got this. And what they did is they kind of embodied the meaning of the name of Laodicea. The meaning of the name of Laodicea is the people's rights, the people's power. And it was by the people's power that they were able to rebuild their city. And they held on to that, right? It's like a Yankee fan saying 27 rings, even though we haven't been good in forever, right? It's like you hold on to it. Right? You hold on to the prestige. And so they held on to that prestige and, uh, you know, of, of this event that happened in their history. And so they had this spirit in them of going like, we don't really need anybody, right? We can muster up what we need to be able to keep ourselves going forward. And so that was the spirit of the city. And that, those were the, that was the water that this church was swimming in. Right? So what do we see Jesus say to the church? Let's get into his words. Well, one of the first things that we'll notice as we look at Jesus' words to this church is that in every other church, there's like something positive that he points out, right? There's some positive thing that he goes like, I see some way that you're being faithful and like, keep going, right? It's not like Jesus is trying to do like a compliment burger or anything like that, but it's just like, he like points out something actually good that they're doing, right? He sees everything and he says, they're doing something actually good and I want you to continue to encourage you to be faithful and to endure and to go forward. But when we get to lay this here, there is no pat on the back, there's no encouragement. There's no commendation. It's direct, right? He goes directly into challenging the way that they are embodying their faith. 
And so it's interesting, right? Because this church, which has all the trappings of love, all the trappings of success, all the resources, all the external factors that you would go, they're doing really well. Jesus goes, this is the church that is most in danger. And what he does is he names their ailment, names their spiritual condition. He names the symptoms of the deeper sickness. What are the symptoms? Well, we look in verses 15 and 16, right? This is a famous passage of of sorts, right? It says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And so how does he assess the spiritual condition of the Laodiceans? He says that they're lukewarm. He says that they're essentially the this, this spiritual embodiment of meh, right? And he uses there an illustration that they would be really familiar with, right? They really understood what he was referring to because he describes, he's actually pointing to something that happen in their city, right? Because, all right, so Laodicea, they have access to all these resources. They have access to all this wealth, but the city had a major flaw. While they had access to wealth and resources, they didn't have access to good water. And so what happened was uh, there were two surrounding cities around it, right? There was one named Hierapolis, which had hot springs, and then there was another city named Colossae, which had cold springs. And the water from those cities were channeled in, not aqueducted. I said that in the 9 a.m., and so I was like, no, that's, that's not a word. So... They were channeled in to the city. And by the time it got to, as time it got to Laodicea, it was this disgusting, lukewarm flavor. And so while they may have used it, maybe, I don't know, like washed their mouth out or washed their hands with, they definitely didn't use it to drink, right? We can relate to this. We live in Phoenix. We know what it's like. And so what Jesus goes is that this water, this water, just like this water was useless because hot water has healing properties, right? Cold water refreshes us. Lukewarm water is useless. And so he compares the church's actions to that. He says that the way that they are acting and embody their faith is useless. And it's useless because they have a knowledge of God that has no real effect on their lives. They have a knowledge of God that has no real effect on their daily lives. They aren't proclaiming and demonstrating him in their daily lives. They just have a head knowledge that actually doesn't really dictate how they live their lives. And so the question then is, what was the deeper problem? Right? Like so many of us are familiar with this and we go, yeah, I know, about, I know that verse where Jesus talks about being a lukewarm Christian and I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian, right? Or sometimes, even some people, I'm not saying I do this, some people accuse other people of being lukewarm Christians. Um, but like, you know, it's, it's familiar to us. It's one of those verses that we're familiar with and we go like, oh man, I don't, want, I don't want to live this way. But I think what can happen, right, is we get stuck there and what lukewarmness actually is, is a symptom of a deeper sickness, Apathy, the ways that maybe we don't engage in our faith to our fullest ability is actually a deeper sick. There's actually a deeper sickness going on. It's a symptom of a deeper sickness at work. And I believe as we continue on, what we see is Jesus actually names that sickness. What does he say in verse 17? He says, for you say I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Man, Jesus, that's a burn, dude. He, was, he went in. But you see, he names the deeper sickness at work. The deeper sickness that was plaguing the Laodicean church was a sickness of self-reliance. It was a sickness of self-sufficiency. It was that spirit of the city that had become contagious and had the, the, the church actually was attracted to. And, and basically what they went is, is like, well, because we're doing so well, right? They equated their material, the material success and condition to their spiritual one. And they said, because we're doing so materially well, we must also be spiritually thriving as well. 
And what they would say is, you know what, this spirit of of self-reliant, that's how they lived out their faith. It made them so content that they felt like they didn't really need anybody. And you know what, even on the right day, that included Jesus as well. He could be a nice decoration on their lives, but he definitely wasn't going to be the declarative word of how they lived. He could fit into their lives as long as it was convenient, but he definitely wasn't going to be the Lord over their life. And so what Jesus does to this church that by all external appearances feels like they're thriving, looks like they're doing so well, is he actually brings them what I like to call under the kingdom cat scan places them underneath it. And he goes, let me wake you up so that you can see in reality how you actually are. So you can see your true condition. He calls them. He says, you believe you're thriving, but you're actually miserable, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Making sure that they got the point. (laughs) And what we remember is this, is that our measurements and God's measurements are quite different. Our ways and his ways are very different, right? Because how do we measure things often? We measure greatness by fame and strength, right? We measure by net worths and follower counts. But Jesus measures by faithful adherence to his word, by how well we can actually proclaim and continue with him. How well we can proclaim and demonstrate his kingdom to the world. You see, in the kingdom, faithfulness trumps all else. And here's the truth about that, right? Is that the standard in which Jesus measures the church hasn't changed. It's the same today. And so, how are we doing? How are we doing today? in light of what we know about how Jesus measures his church. Well, I can't speak to about the church all around the world, right? I'm not there, but I'm here, right here, in these, American, in these United States of America. And I could talk about the church right here. And what I know is that as we think that, or as we try to gauge how we're doing, we're not left without direction. Actually, the Laodicean church is really helpful in this regards. It acts as a mirror in which we, as the church today, here in the West, here in the United States, we should look very deeply in. Why? If you haven't gotten there already, right, our circumstances and their circumstances are very similar. Very, very similar, right? We are confronted with some comparable threats. But this reality that we reside in one of the richest nations in the entire world, Access to so much, access to so many resources, especially, you know, definitely in comparison with the rest of the world. But beyond that, right, we have this story that shapes us as Americans, right? We have this story where we esteem the self-made person. I think about the people that we, we, we make and turn into celebrities, right? Are the, they're the people in our minds who have been able, in our own minds, to be overnight successes, Right, to be able to, to, to climb the ladder on their own. By all accounts, we're able to pull themselves into greatness, and that's the people that we esteem, and that's the ideal that many of us are chasing after. We esteem the self-made person. And so what I often like to say is that when it comes to living here, living out your faith in the United States, it can be a really tough place. And I think oftentimes we think about tough places for faith. We think about persecution and places where you'll be in danger for proclaiming the name of Jesus. But the danger is that, you know, in some of those places, right, you go there and you meet physical needs and people can open up, right? They'll be like, well, I see like my, my, my need, like tell me about the God who's the provider. But the danger here is how do you maintain your sense of need? How do you maintain your sense of dependence, when you can just like move your fingers on your phone and a full feast can be at your door in, I don't know, 30 minutes, right? How do you maintain your sense of need in a, in a, in a place like ours? Truth is, it's like exhausting to not get comfortable. And dependence on Jesus, right? Like not being self-reliant, it itself is exhausting because it requires patience. 
right? And how often are we in a rush to just get healthy in our minds versus being holy and being faithful to the life that Jesus may be calling us to? How, how often we are in a rush and we don't really want to wait on maybe the ways that God wants us to actually act. We just want to move on our own decisions and by our own speed versus the speed of prayer. It's tough. So one of the things that I know is helpful when you go to the doctor, and you go to the doctor, they usually, if you're going for like a physical or something, before, I don't know, they start checking your temperature and all that, they start, they, they start by asking you some questions, right? And he goes, they usually go, hey, here are some questions I'm going to ask just to get an assessment of like where you are, right? So you can actually, you know, they can begin to assess where you are health-wise. And for the church today, uh, for us today, um, I've put together some questions for us to consider, for us to consider if the story of self-reliance is maybe shaping us more than we realize. And so those questions will be on the screen now. One of the questions, I'll talk to a couple of them. First one is, many are in pursuit of what they consider the good life. Does your vision of the good life actually lead you to a greater dependence on God? Right? Is he actually, does it matter if like Jesus is like with you in those moments? And it's interesting, right? Like we, even with good things, we often just think about what we'll gain versus what we may lose, right? Like even good things have trade-offs. Even a promotion, as good as it can be, has a trade-off, right? Sometimes it requires more time. And often the question isn't like, is this good or bad? It's like, what will this do to me? What will this actually do for my life with Jesus? Another thing is money can be our foundation, right? And so are your everyday decisions dictated more by finances and maximizing pleasure rather than being faithful? Do you pray? Prayer reveals a lot. Right? A prayerless life can display a careless posture towards, towards God's direction in your life. Do you believe that God can use the challenges in your life to shape you? For his purpose, or are they just running interference on your life's plan? Would your friends who don't attend church be surprised to discover that you're a Christian? Right? If you tell someone who doesn't go to church that you're a Christian and they're like totally surprised, that tells us something. It tells us something. It tells us that what we may be doing, how we may be living, is like treating our faith like the parts of a doll, popping off when we need it, popping parts off when we need it versus treating it like a body part that goes with us everywhere we go. We may do that because we may see our faith as a threat to our plan. We may act like that out of a place of, or from a place of fear. And just going along with that, it's like, do you find the words of Jesus good for Sunday, but too impractical for Monday through Saturday? Remember what our Lord prayed. What did he pray? He said, God's kingdom, to, he prayed for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth. And when he prayed that, he didn't just say on Sunday or in a small group or when we're with our Christian friends, but he prayed it over the entirety of earth, right? Over all of life. And so what we have to be mindful of is in that prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In our self-reliance, we can replace the thy for my. And it becomes my kingdom come, my will be done, as we live out of dependence on him. And so what these questions are hopefully, uh, my, my hope would be with them is that they would help us to consider, are there some ways that self-reliance is shaping our faith more than dependence on Jesus? And what I've always learned that when it comes to medical professionals, you shouldn't lie, right? If you lie, you're not going to get the help that you actually need, right? But the thing is, you know, maybe at some level you could fool the doctor. And while you may be able to fool the doctor, you can't fool the great physician. He sees beneath all the veneers that we put up. He sees the very depths of our hearts. He sees if our faith has just become a decoration on our lives versus something we're vitally connected to. 
He knows if we just have contact with him versus deep communion. He knows if we're treating him more like a good luck charm than our savior. He knows if we're treating him more like a holy ATM versus the Lord over our lives. So we want to be honest about where we are to the God who can see our hearts, who knows our hearts. And here is something I know. I also know for some of you today, you would go, yeah, that's, that might be true. Right? But I feel like I'm doing pretty well on my own. I don't really need any help. I'm kind of doing this myself, and I have just enough Jesus in my life. And so you would go, um, I'm doing just fine. And my question to those who would say that is, are you really doing just fine? Are you actually doing just fine? Does the anxiety, the stress that you carry each day, the uncertainty that you carry, even as we live in an age of information unprecedented in any other time in history, does that show that you are doing fine as your anxiety, stress, and uncertainty are off the charts? Does it say that you're doing fine? When each night when you try to fall asleep that you just can't fall asleep because you can't turn your mind off. You're carrying all the pressure of the prior day and the current day and the day to come and it's weighing all on you because in your mind it's all on you. Does that show that you're actually doing fine? Even though you got the king size bed, even though you got the 1,000 thread sheet counts and the body pillow and the 25 other pillows, you can't fall asleep because you don't have peace in your soul to actually bring your body to rest. Does that show that you're doing fine? I could keep going. How about the growing pile of Amazon boxes outside of our doors? Right? The, the, as we go on Amazon, you look at your orders from year to year. Which direction is it going? For most of us, up, 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 up. And it's going up because we're buying things, because we, 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 we're buying it not even for ourselves. We're buying it to gain the respect and admiration of other people because we live in a culture that's driven by envy. And we buy thing after thing, thinking the next thing is actually what's going to bring us satisfaction. And where are we in two weeks? Right back on the side again. Trying to purchase our way to peace and not getting there. Not quite filling the void. What about the endless ways that we have to distract ourselves each day? The endless scrolling, the endless amount of time on sports. That one's for me. The endless amount of time that we just live distracted and impatient and even treat the people that we love as inconveniences, living mindlessly, not actually giving attention to the things that require attention because we're trying to escape it all. Does this show that we are doing fine? Or maybe what all these things point to is that fine is just a four-letter word that we're hiding behind. And if you think that you are fine apart from Jesus, you are only fooled. We need him. Because here's the thing. You can have a surplus of stuff. You can have a surplus of, 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 of experiences. And you know what you're short on? Actual peace. Actual satisfaction. Actual, actually satisfaction and actually experiencing the peace that we can't purchase, that we can't innovate that we must receive from the Prince of Peace himself. So we need him to heal us, to turn us away from our own striving to save ourselves. Do you feel the need? Can you see how we need the great physician? And here's the good news about him. Good news about him is what he said from the, in the Gospel of Luke, right? He says, if, we, if we're at a place of need, we're actually at, like, on the road to health. We're actually on the right road. We're in the right place. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but it's those who are sick. And he is the one who has not come to call the righteous, but has come to call sinners to repentance. Amen. And so this is what he offers us, right? He offers us to get well. And it's exactly what we see him offer the church in Laodicea. He offers them a treatment plan to get well. 
Pick up with me in Revelation 3. We're going to go verses 18 through 22. There it goes. It goes, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Excuse me. And solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Thank you so much for supporting me there, wherever that child is. I love it. Um, so Jesus, what does he say? The great physician, he says, enter into my treatment plan. He's the great physician who invites us to redefine, to remember, and to reach toward him. That's the treatment plan. Redefine, remember, and reach toward him. We'll get into each one of those parts. But before we do, let's do this. Look, look, look at the posture of Jesus. Right? In spite of this church, which has totally rejected him, which has totally turned their back on him, what do we see him doing? Pursuing. Pursuing this church, which is rejecting him. He keeps reaching out and saying, will you get well and walk with me again? And that's what we see him doing, right? We see him calling out and challenging this church, right? Disciplining this church. And he's not doing it from a place of shame. He's not doing it just to shame them. He's doing it because he loves them. Right, this thought came to my mind yesterday. We were at a, my wife and my family and I, we were at this parade. And just before the parade uh, started, my daughter Elliot ran right into the street, right? And so, like, I'm seeing the floats coming and I just run and, like, grab her. And she's all mad with me. I think she's still mad with me over there. And, you know, I, I did that not to stop her fun, not because I wanted her to, to, to not enjoy the parade, but it was because she was in danger's way, right? And so I went and rescued her. So if you see her today, Tell her about herself. <laughs> so that's what we see Jesus doing with the church, right? And when he goes, he wants the church to recognize some things. And one of the things that, uh, just some of the things that self-reliance has led them to. You see, self-reliance has led them to basically build walls around their heart. They build all these walls around their heart. Right? And the, the, what Jesus is going is like, you've built all these walls around your heart. But still, I am there knocking. Still, I'm at your door knocking. I stand, he goes, I stand outside of your desire to save yourself, and I knock. I stand outside your apathy because you're experiencing just the futility of trying to save yourself, and I knock. I stand outside all your desires to be comfort comfortable and to not have me as the Lord of your life, and I knock. And so the question is, will they make room for him? Will we actually make room for the God who is pursuing us to, to relationship back to him? Oh, my gosh, there's like a spider or something up there, man. I had to get that out of there, man. Uh, the enemy, man, he's real. Uh, gosh. All right. The question is, will we enter the treatment plan of the healer? Lord knows I nearly needed a treatment plan just there. So, <laughs> Will we actually take the steps towards recovery? And so what does it look like for us to enter this treatment plan? Well, I've identified three things from what Jesus names, right, to the church that I feel like are the steps that look like steps towards health. I think one of the first ones is we need redefinitions. We need to redefine things. We need to de redefine terms like health. We need to redefine terms like being well off, right? When we hear that word, where, does our minds go? where do our minds go immediately? Money, material things. And what we have to realize is that sometimes, right, material success isn't bad in itself. But the reality is our possessions can possess us, right? The reality is, is that sometimes material success might 
trick you into thinking you're growing when you're actually shrinking. You can be adding a bunch of acres to your life, but be dying inside. I've heard it said that success can bruise your soul way worse than failure ever could. Some people's achievements are actually like chains. And so what our prayer should be in the midst of that is, Lord, please help success not shrink me into self-reliance. And here's the truth of it. Whether we are experiencing highs or lows in life, may our lives never be dictated by those circumstances, high or low. Our eyes on Jesus the entire time. And what Jesus offers the church, he goes, I'm going to give you actually what riches, like the actual riches that you're looking for. As you turn every place else and look for it and end up empty, right, and end up in that condition that he names, he says, turn to me and experience true riches. Turn to me and experience real health. Turn to me and experience actually true wealth as I give you the abundant life that can only be found with me. That moth and rust and tragedy and all the things that happen in life cannot destroy. Come to me and actually experience the true riches of what life is all about. Do you abide with me and I with you? He goes, let me give you true vision. Right, for a church that was very familiar with eye medication, as they exported that good to help people all around the world, somehow they had lost their vision. And he goes, come to me and actually experience true sight so that you will no longer be dece- deceived into thinking right, that because you're materially well, that you're spiritually healthy as well. Come and actually let me give you the sight to be able to look in the mirror and see yourself in truth. And he goes, for the church that maybe has made everything else their security, right, that they have made their resources their security, they've made their wealth their security, they've made their status their security, he says, no, come, in me, come to me and actually experience true security as you plant your feet on the firm foundation that will stand, that is unshakable no matter what happens. Come to me, that plant your feet in the firm foundation. Let me cover you in a way that tragedy in a way that all the different things that happen to the economy, all these things that as we try to be self-reliant, what do they do? They put us to shame. They come and remind us of our humanity and that we can't actually save ourselves. It says, come to me and actually experience true security. Here's the truth of it. The greatest of human strength cannot secure for us the blessings that God has prepared for those who love him. Those have to come from him. I think we have to remind ourselves of this, right? Because I think for so many of us, we're on this this journey to stability, right? We're just like, I just want to be stable. I just want to be able to, to get my life in a nice, comfortable place. And what we're often saying there as we even think about it that way is like, I got myself here and I have to maintain myself here. And stability is a good thing, but like any good thing, it could be transformed into an idol, And what stability may go, our search for stability may go, you know what, I'm so good right here that Jesus, work on everybody else, but leave me alone. (laughs) Right, do your thing with everybody else, but I'm good and fine and perfect here. And so what, what happens is in our search for stability, in our search to stabilize, we miss out on the beautiful ways that Jesus actually wants to revitalize our lives. On the beautiful ways that he wants to maybe call us into deeper faithfulness and deeper relationship with him. So we always want to live in dependence on him, not chase stability so we feel like we can stand on our own and have no need for him. So that's first. Second thing is this, right? We we, we remember. We can actually redefine because, or or, or we can actually give things a redefinition by remembering who Jesus is. You've heard us say this in sermon after sermon. Each week we've said, we got to remember who Jesus is. We got to remember who Jesus is. See, we never get past that as a church. We got to remember who he is. And Jesus reminded the church who he is. He said in verse 14, he is the amen to the church that believes that it must persevere in its own strength. To the people that believe it must persevere in its own strength. He goes, I am the embodiment of the affirmation of all God's promises. You don't get there by your own strength. You get that because he is the yesterday amen for all God's promises. 
We get that by trusting in him. We get that by living in dependence on him. To the church that might be tempted to gauge itself by external standards, right? To gauge itself by going, we've been able to do so much for ourselves. He says he is the true and faithful witness. And what does he remind us of? He reminds us that he is our benchmark, that he is our standard, that we are not called to measure things by their largeness or their fame, but we are called to measure and to live in faithfulness. We are called to continue in the kingdom standards that he has given us as we look to image him as his people, faithful and true. Lastly, he goes, I am the beginning of God's creation. To the church that's been relying on his strength, he reminds them that he is the one who is the Lord over all creation. He is the one who has brought things to be. As it says in the letter to the Colossians, what does it say? He says he is the one who holds it all together. And so it's his strength that is keeping us. It's his strength that woke us up this morning, got us into church, and is allowing us to be here this morning. It's in his strength that, as it says in the book of Acts, it's in him that we move and live and have our being. And so it's in his strength. We don't just want to start with. We want to live sustained independence on him. Remembering who he is. Lastly, this. It's not just about remembering. It's not just recalling his identity as Lord over all. It's remembering that he is the God who is in reach. He is the God who is near to us in our everyday lives. He's always in reach. He's always knocking on the door of our heart and hearts. And I know for some of you today, it's not that your heart is just hardened, it's that it's wounded by something difficult that is happening or has happened in your life. And so your heart today is full of stress. Your heart today is full of anxiety. Your heart today is full of all sorts of hurts because of something that you've gone through, some disappointment, some sin. The beauty of our Savior is he offers this invitation. He says, reach toward me. Everyone who is worn out, everyone who is tired of striving in their own strength, everyone who's been on the hamster wheel of self-salvation, come to me and find rest for your souls. You see, the most beautiful work that the great physician carries out, it's not even on the body, it's that he mends the very depths of our soul. He invites, that, he invites us to that today. He says, reach toward him. And the, 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 the thing that's so good about that, right, is as we reach toward him, we don't have to climb a ladder to get to him. We don't have to go across the sea. We don't have to hop on a plane. All right, what does it tell us? What does the word tell us? It tells us that while we were still sinners, before we even reached out to him, he reached out toward us. Christ died for us. God sent his son to save and rescue us from the futility of self-salvation because we can't do it. We need him to be our savior. We need him to be the one who is guiding and directing us and freeing us from the chains of ourself. And the good news is that's exactly what he did. He bridged the gap through the power of the cross, church. You see, the cross is, is God's love reaching toward us, moving toward us, right? There's that commercial out there. It goes, he gets us, and I like it. But what I even like it more is he gets to us. He got to our pain. He got to our anxiety. He got to our very brokenness, right, and came and rescued us so that we can be with him, so that we can be freed from the power and penalty of sin so that we can be freed from the striving of self-salvation that only kills and crushes us. And so the, there's no doubt that our Lord has reached toward us, has reached out toward us. The question is, will we reach toward him? Will we make room for him in our lives? Or will we try to continue to do it our own way? Will we miss out on the peace that only comes from the Prince of Peace himself, that only comes from the power of his presence in our lives, the healing that can only be found in him. See, you don't have to remain sick. You don't have to remain uh, just totally trapped in your position, in your condition. Our good news is that our good savior, our great physician has come and he brings healing in his hands, amen? Let's pray.
<clears throat> Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that when we have gone astray, Lord, when we have wandered from you, God, you never give up on us. You continue to pursue us with your love. You continue to seek us out and invite us to actually experience real health with you. And so, Lord, I pray for the many of us, right, the many of us who forget that, right, who have, Lord, some understanding of what you've done, Lord, but are not letting it actually influence our everyday lives, Lord. Not letting ourselves actually rest in your finished work, but thinking we need to finish the work ourselves. God, help us to hold on to you. God, it's so easy to think that, Lord, we're gonna save ourselves, and yet thing after thing reminds us we just can't do that. The good news is we have you. You are a savior. You are a rescuer. You are the one who's in pursuit of us because you love us. And so, God, if we have built up walls in our hearts to wall you out, Lord, let us hear your voice. Let us hear your knocking and invite you, Lord, to experience or invite you in, Lord, so we can actually experience just the, the, the beauty of communion with you. Lead us, God, into this week as we need to remember this truth day by day each week, Lord. Bring it to memory and let your love flow through us, revitalize us, bring us to the knowledge of the truth. Your name, amen. So now we're going to move into a time of response. Here at Redemption, we respond in four ways. First way is through singing. Respond by singing. And we sing because we want to lift our voices up to the God who is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of it all. And so we sing to him. And we sing as a family of God, reminding brothers and sisters of the God who's our Father, who's good to us. Next, we respond in giving. Right? And giving is an overflow. Giving is an overflow of God's affluence in our lives, the affluence of God's love in our lives. It overflows and looks like generosity. Right? And so we give recognizing everything that we have. We've gained it. It comes from him. And so if you're led today, I invite you to give in the giving boxes in the back, or you can give online through our app. Next, we respond through prayer. And what I would say today, if you felt the spirit moving on your heart, right, if you're here today and you're like, yeah, I'm tired. Yeah, I've gotten to the end of myself. I invite you to come forward and we would love to pray with and for you. We'd love to bring that before God. Right? And so we'll have people on both sides of the room that would love to pray with and for you. And then lastly, it's just communion. I remember that we live not just in contact with Jesus, we have deep communion with him. That he's with us everywhere we go. That he is the God who is in reach. And we come forward each week and take communion, right? remembering our identity as his people. Remembering our identity of how we're called to be faithful and living and following after him. So I invite you now as the band leads us in singing to come forward and to respond as the spirit leads.